until now in conventional geomechanics whatever you have studied is a part of the geometrical characterization mostly the characterization dealt with the geological characterization the way the soils are formed genesis of formation type of weathering type of deposition type of agencies which are responsible for formation of soils then you use different types of classification schemes to understand the behavior of the material uh, uscs isscs ashto usbr uh, these are the techniques to characterize the geomaterials then you also talked about the mineralogical characterization but not in full and uh, chemical characterization conventional geomechanics does not deal with much and of course the morphological characterization is not done much under the realm of conventional geomechanics but of course compressibility compactability consolidation characteristics and ultimately the shear strength characteristics these are all different types of characterization schemes which are utilized to characterize geomaterials so in this context if you really want to study the holistic characterization scheme or the plan of action we have already talked about uh, the need for geometrical characterization uh, first being a geotechnical engineer our emphasis would be to understand how geomaterials should be characterized for their geotechnical characteristics followed by the mineralogy because the geotechnical characteristics are heavily dependent upon the mineralogy of geomaterial uh, followed by the morphology morphology is the uh, granulometry also sometimes uh, we talk about the particle shape uh, roundness flakiness and uh, regularity irregularity and so on then we will be talking about the physical characterization schemes what is the physics of the material because geotechnical properties will also depend upon the uh, morphology and physical characteristics could be uh, same and these two characteristics influence geotechnical properties quite a lot then we will have a prolonged discussion on chemical characterization of geomaterials where we will be talking about pore solution sampling which is quite contemporary and then uh, corrosion potential of the soils uh, modern day infrastructure and uh, particularly the industries uh, which are conveying either a fluid or uh, you know material in solid form a good example would be conveyance of fly ash in the dry form in the pipelines it could be in the wet form also it could be in the dry form also so these pipelines are the you know lifeline of the nation and uh, in conventional geotechnical engineering we have not done much justice with the buried pipeline design apart from the mechanical load how these pipelines get corroded in the due course of time is a matter of uh, great concern to most of the companies which are dealing with uh, conveying anything through the pipeline be it oil gas solids semi solids dredging industry and so on we will talk about sorption desorption from this point onwards uh, that how these mechanisms are utilized to quantify the soil contaminant interaction. So until now whatever I have been discussing was uh, abstract, I have been only creating situations where the contaminants come in contact with geomaterials and then the question was what happens then. Uh, once you start dealing with the sorption desorption mechanisms, uh, you can quantify this interaction and once it has been quantified it can be utilized the way you want it to then we will be talking about thermal characterization of uh, geomaterials next would be electrical characterization of geomaterials followed by magnetic characterization of geomaterials and this would be followed by biological characterization of geomaterials uh, but as i said uh, biological characterization is yet in a very nascent stage in geotechnical engineering so Deliberately, I am not going to deal much with the biological characterization and same is the case with magnetic characterization also. So, I would not be dealing much in details and similarly, uh, the characterization of geomaterials based on the radiations. So, these three are, I am not going to talk about in this course, these are uh, very active research areas in which my students are working and we are still trying to evolve. 
various processes associated with this. You must have realized that uh, when I have created this list of geometrical characterization, uh, most of the emphasis is on how a in environmental energy field is going to influence the geomaterials and a good example would be thermal, electrical, magnetic, biological and radiation processes apart from the mechanical energy field which we talk about. So, you will be surprised to know that how much uh, information has already been created and this answers one of your question which you were asking some time back that what is the state of the characterization schemes. So, uh, the foundations have already been well laid, only thing is that stuffing has to be done and make these methodologies which uh, we have proposed and the type of instrumentation which we have created has to be more and more uh, generalized, alright. So, need for geometrical characterization has already been discussed uh, in the previous lecture and uh, all physical, chemical, mineralogical, thermal, electrical uh, energy fields would alter the properties of the uh, geo, uh, uh, geomaterials, particularly geotechnical properties. So, this is what the big question mark is how to study these effects, how to quantify them, how to utilize them in day to day practice. So, you may say from this point onwards uh, the R and D uh, and you know most of the real life problems how they have been solved, they have been tackled by our research group I am going to talk about. I think I also discussed about the THM model uh, where uh, you know high, how thermo hydromechanical coupling is becoming a very important feature in uh, uh, geotechnical engineering, contemporary geotechnical engineering and I gave examples from atomic uh, waste disposal and uh, design of buffers. That is a good example of how the geotechnical aspects of the material would change uh, once you uh, create a situation where the geomaterial interacts with the aggressive environment and aggressive environment would be extremely high chemical concentrations, extremely high uh, you know thermal cons uh, thermal gradients, extremely high electrical gradients and so on. And uh, I think I also discussed about what is the importance of THMB and THMCB also. So, C is missing here I think you should add here this should be thermo hydro mechanical models, next should be thermo hydro mechanical chemical models THMC followed by thermohydro mechanical chemical biological models THMCB. So, this is what the recent trend is and people are trying to work on add chemical part to these models. So, as far as geotechnical characterization is concerned uh, you normally talk about the void ratios and porosity of the geomaterials you know how to compute them. Of course, there are uh, latest developments in the field of uh, even computing the void ratios and the porosity and as I have been telling in the past that uh, conventional equipments are not used for determining the void ratio and the porosity uh, anymore because this is the era of instrumentation and particularly electronics. So, people want to measure all these things under in situ conditions. Similarly, compaction also gone are the days when people used to uh, do compaction control by taking the you know uh, course of the sample or by sand displacement. Uh, look at the type of infrastructure which is being developed in the country right now, you know 2000 kilometers of the infrastructure is being developed every day that is what the statistics are. So, how many core samples you can take at what depth? So, this also has changed now to more of uh, recent instrumentations where people are using different types of probes, nuclear density probes, gauges, thermal probes and uh, electrical probes to compute the in situ densities. Consolidation and compressibility is of great importance to the geotechnical engineers and uh, there are techniques by which people are measuring the in situ consolidation characteristics and compressibility of the soils. Uh, this is where somewhere hydraulic conductivity also comes in the picture, you know when you are designing the systems, uh, it is not the hydraulic conductivity, but uh, the conductivity of the flux which I emphasized in one of the lectures is becoming more important. So, hydraulic conductivity is the flux of water when it is flowing through the porous media. It could be thermal flux, it could be magnetic flux, it could be chemical flux, it could be radiation flux, it could be biological flux and so on. Shear strength parameters uh, you know how to obtain for the geomaterials and uh, normally we conduct uh, triaxial test, 
shear box test and if we want to find out the in situ characteristic there are several types of tests like vane shear and flat jack and uh, you know uh, what, do, what else you are aware of dilatometers are normally used to get the shear strength characteristics. There is something uh, which is not normally covered in uh, conventional geomechanics uh, is the collapse potential of the soil. Particularly this subject becomes very important uh, when you are dealing with the soils which are sandy materials like in the Middle East region where, uh, where you have deserts and uh, you cannot conduct shear strength parameters, you cannot conduct shear strength test to obtain the shear strength parameters. In our country also now most of the infrastructure is being developed in the western part of the country, a lot of oil exploration is going on in the desert area and 9, 10 big oil fields have been established, you should read in Google and try to understand what are the challenges these uh, oil companies are facing when they have to do infrastructure design on soils which are collapsible. So, what is meant by collapsible soils? Normally, the instability caused in the void ratios per unit volume is defined as the collapse potential in percentages. So, if you look at this graph, uh, normally what is done is you take a odometer ring and in odometer ring you pack the dry soil at a certain density, granular soils not the cohesive soils. And then at a certain stress where you are interested in finding out how much the material would collapse in terms of it voids, you inundate it. So, as if I am trying to simulate something which is happening in the nature, imagine there is a heap of industrial byproducts which is lying and all of a sudden rains come. So, this is what actually we are getting in the laboratory, how much structural collapse of this type of heaps is going to occur, this could be municipal solid waste also where people are interested in. So, sigma prime would be the effective stress at which the inundation is done and because of flooding or because of interaction of the geometry with water, how much void ratios change, this is the collapse. So, people who are working in desert areas, they utilize this scheme for dealing with their design and uh, you know execution of the projects. So, E naught is the initial void ratio and E f is the final void ratio at a given sigma prime and 1 plus E naught is the uh, you know unit volume of the soils, you must have studied in geomechanics. So, in because we are dealing with the industrial byproducts quite a lot, uh, we have to deal with the collapse potential based classification scheme. The second in the series is the mineralogical characterization. Normally XRD is done for uh, mineralogical characterization of geomaterials and nowadays you have uh, very advanced uh, tools which are used for obtaining the X-ray diffraction patterns of the geomaterials. So, these are the types of machines which we have in IIT Bombay and several other institutes. Government of India has created advanced instrumentation facilities which we call as SAFE, S-A-I-F, sophisticated and advanced instrumentation facility which is created by DST, the five locations in the country. Uh, the region was that uh, is a regional facility where people can do advanced testing of the geomaterials. So, most of our research depends heavily on the facilities which SAFE provides. So, essentially what is done is you take a sample and uh, you know bombard this sample with the X-rays and then uh, record the diffraction pattern. So, I will show you how the analysis is done. The second in the series is scanning electron microscopy. Uh, I will also show you today how scanning electron microscopy is done to realize uh, the orientation of the grains which uh, you might have studied only in the books, but uh, you might not have realized that how the real life pictures look like. So, by using XRD and SEM, we can find out the mineralogical characteristics of the of the geomaterials. Sometimes uh, these could be EDACs. So, we can have the you know diffraction pattern at the same time when I am seeing the environmental scanning of the material depending upon the requirements. This is how the uh, results look like. 
So, if you look at the XRD analysis, uh, these are known as XRD diffractograms. Uh, I can utilize this information in several manners. For, first of all, as a civil engineer, I would like to use the inert materials in the foundation systems. I do not want to use a material which is uh, very active all right, chemically or physically I would say. So, XRD is a technique where I take some sample and by using the Bragg's law if you remember 2D sin theta equal to L lambda in your physics course you must have studied 10 plus 2 or maybe later on in engineering. So, if I know the lambda is the wavelength of the wave which I am using to bombard on the sample. I can find out the d and d happens to be the intermolecular spacing of the atoms or the lattice structure what we call as. So, you must have studied the lattice structure of a crystal a b c all right. So, these things are becoming very prominent nowadays. So, if you look at one of the diffractograms on the y axis we have relative intensity and on the x axis we have uh, copper k alpha is a filter through which the x rays are channelized monochromatic you must have studied in your uh, physics courses how to create a light in the monochromatic form and then so this happens to be the 2 times theta where theta is the angle of incidence of the waves. So, if you can fix theta and if you know the wavelength of the rays which you are using you can compute d 2 d sin theta equal to n lambda is the Bragg's law. Now, corresponding to 2 theta value, we get uh, different peaks of the minerals. So, simply by looking at the XRD patterns, I can make out whether the material is active or inert. So, the thumb rule says the more and more peaks you have in the material, this material is going to be crystalline. Clear? A crystalline material would not react on its own unless you do some chemical treatment or unless you pulverize it all right. We were talking about uh, ultra high uh, active fly ashes, ultra fine fly ashes you know and this is where I told you that either you can use a classifier to separate different particles and of different densities and different shapes or what you can do is you can apply different type of fields. It could be air field, it could be density separation by putting the electromagnetic uh, electric field or whatever electromagnetic fields. So, these are the techniques which people are practicing and uh, the more and more peaks you get the material is bound to be crystalline, inert material, good material to be utilized for creating foundations, fillings, reclamation all right. But if you have a material like this where you do not have distinct peaks, the story is different. So, what this indicates is that this material is going to be a highly reactive material and we call this material as a material which has lot of glassy phase in this glass G L A S S glass. So, if you take cement and if, if you do the XRD you will get something of this sort there is no distinct peak over here. So, and lot of hazy XRD pattern shows that this material is having potential to be a good pozzolanic material because when you have more glass present in the system, the system becomes reactive all right. So, this is one of the ways to differentiate between uh, the activity of the material active and passive minerals. So, in any walk of life if you are a hardcore geotechnical engineer or you are a material scientist working in the field of uh, cement and concrete technology or design of resins, filters, different types of uh, you know catalysts uh, you will have to depend upon this. Now, this also gives me an opportunity to interact with people from different departments and different streams because our interests are common. I just want to characterize the material. So, nowadays the um, world has changed earlier we used to sit down and up to the fourth decimal place of theta value we used to match the minerals in present in the soil and this used to be very tedious work. So, earlier students of mine they spent 3, 3, 4, 4 months all together characterizing one soil. Can you believe this? Nowadays a matter of few hours. So, we have these type of softwares uh, which are known as JCPDS files you know there is a powder diffraction file, there is a CD-ROM and uh, sometimes people use uh, ICSD 
inorganic crystal structure database. The results are listed over here. So, for different types of soils, what you observe is that mineralogical composition in a uh, qualitative manner can be obtained, alright. And since Dr. Susha's thesis, uh, we started getting the quantitative mineralogical phases also. So, this is something one stage ahead of what is happening in today's world. Our lab has been quite active and we are much ahead of what the practices are in the market right now. So, I can do the you know um, qualitative analysis of the phase of the minerals and uh, there are softwares which are available and known as expert high score EXPERT expert high score. So, if you get time just google it and you will realize how these type of softwares are being used to quantify the mineralogical phases. The question is where I am going to use all this information. So, we have been talking about application of geomaterials in buffers for the radioactive waste disposal. Now, this is a very interesting and practical problem, but multi-phase problem. The structural stability of uh, the material should be good number one. At the same time chemical affinity and the reactivity of the material should also be extremely high. So, this is a system when you are dealing with nuclear waste disposal uh, the material is supposed to bear the mechanical loads, thermal loads, chemical loads, biological loads and radiological loads. Now, I think you can understand where these type of studies are being done and this is where you have to select minerals also. So, gone are the days when naturally occurring minerals used to be used in the industry because nowadays people are you know they are very demanding. So, every nation has its own demand for creation of a mineral of a certain specific value for the various applications. So, suppose there is a breach of atomic power plant and most of the atomic activity comes in the water in the sea because most of these establishments are on the seashores. The chances are the entire seabed or the sands on the shore may get contaminated. It is a very practical problem for which you were contacted some time back by from by a country and they wanted us to create minerals of a certain specific value. We will be talking about this later on. So, these are the things which are happening in the realm of uh, geotechnical engineering I am sure you must be finding it a big story, but this is what is being done. So, if you click on this you will find that there is a information which is available on the website about ISCDS. Uh, you know this is what uh, is the need of the hour. So, good geotechnical engineering can only be done once you start from the mineralogical characterization of soils or the minerals. So, this shows uh, how the lattice also can be quantified. So, you can just go through this site and try to learn uh, what are the facilities which are available in today's world. I hope you can realize that uh, when people join my group it becomes uh, for them a challenge to cope up with what has already been done and what is being done because our expectations are extremely high from the people. But unless expectations are high things cannot be done. This is the first thing people are supposed to learn. Now, if I quickly analyze this data which is present in the table, you will find that most of the geomaterials would have quartz alright, elite, kieranite, calcite, feldspar, hematite. So, hematite is the one which is mostly present in the fly ashes, it comes as an impurity in the coal. RSS is the uh, red sandstone and uh, BSS is the brown sandstone from different parts of the world we corrected this. IC is the chalk sample which I got from Israel because Israeli chalk has a very high porosity and their aquifers are mostly chalk uh, based aquifers. So, what different projects I have been studying uh, the formations from different uh, continents and C1 and C2 are the uh, cenospheres which you separate out from the fly ash. Uh, by different techniques. 
So, classifier which I have talked about is one of the ways you can do density separation, you can do filtration from the sea from the lagoons, these are all subjects where a lot of entrepreneurship is uh, being done by young guys and uh, for your information uh, the senospheres are the pure quartz and they can be utilized for substitution uh, for pure silica in the electronic industry. So, if you check it on net you will find at least uh, there are 350 applications of senospheres which are in the market right now alright. So, these are the subjects which are picking up at, at the at the moment alright. So, one of the most challenging tasks which I think I may give it to you is suppose if these are the materials which are naturally occurring and if I ask you use filter out a certain type of mineral and sell it in the market. It is something very interesting, very commercial uh, you know question that from the soil which is lying here and there how can I produce a mineral and people are working on it. 